for being with us this morning, and uh, we are excited to uh, to worship together. We're going to be uh, doing that here in just a minute, but a couple announcements for you as we look forward to this coming week and uh, in a couple weeks. Uh, men, guys, if, uh, if you are not doing anything Saturday morning, let me encourage you to join us. Seven o'clock, I know Saturday's like, oh man, I was going to sleep in. But uh, breakfast, though, with a bunch of guys and a focus on God's word and how we can encourage each other in that way, that is value right there. So, uh, so let me encourage you to come to that this Saturday, 7 o'clock. Uh, we're going to be studying a book that is, I think, a great, great spin on a really, really important topic. Uh, it's, uh, it, when we study books like this, we remember, of course, the word of God. God is our uh, ultimate source of truth. But this book unpacks that. Uh, it's it's got by, uh, by Ray Ortland. It's called The Death of Porn, Men of Integrity Building a World of Nobility. And uh, the encouragement that this book has is that we as men, as Christian men, uh, do what we can to push back on, uh, on, on the cultural pressures that are all around us. So let me encourage you, men, if, uh, even if it's you come for just this study as, uh, as we'll do this, it'll take us about six times to go through this, six uh, meetings. Um, it'll be good. I think it'll be really important, and I think it'll produce in us personally and in our church family uh, a real uh, measure of, uh, of togetherness and kind of an accountability of, like, hey, we're, we're in this together type thing. So I can't say enough about this. Guys, this Saturday, 7 o'clock, come join us for breakfast. The breakfast is good, too, just in case you were wondering. It is worth coming to. Um, also, uh, on September uh, 30th, on September 30th, we have a missions dinner coming up. And uh, I wanted to kind of unpack some of this for you. First of all, just some, some housekeeping things. Uh, if you have not signed up, you need to sign up out here. If you have already signed up, you need to go back to the sign-up paper and just let us know what you want to eat. There's a choice of, uh, of protein. I, I can't remember what it is now. There's probably chicken and something else. So uh, if you want to... Um, to, to do that, we need to, we need to kind of have an idea of how many are coming, and we'd love to be able to do that. If you forget to do that, please come anyway, because uh, we do try and plan for, for extra, but uh, it is helpful to have that. This dinner is called What's the Point? And the idea behind this is to, one, think, okay, what, why, why do missions? Why are we doing this? What's the point of missions? But there's a play on words as well, as we want to think about our missions our, our mission here at Troy, there's a point, a point of light in the darkness. And then as we call and send missionaries to various places in the United States and abroad, those are other points of light. Uh, and, and, of course, as we think about that, we want to be thinking about how can we support and that sort of thing. There will be uh, an auction, at, which you do not have to participate in, but there are going to be some, uh, I would say, there's a few different things, but some of them in the category of experiences, all right, uh, it's it's a whole package of like something that you can do or take home, or it, it it's a basket, okay, of of lots of goodies in there, basically. So there's going to be some things to to uh, you can support our missions in that way if you'd like to. Uh, there's a there's a suggested donation of ten dollars to uh, to come to the dinner, um, but we want our first goal, first and foremost goal here is to strengthen our church with regard to a commitment to missions home and abroad, and, uh, and, and certainly an idea of, uh, of how God can use us in that. So please, make sure that you uh, carve out some time for that. I know we're all busy right now, but love to be able to do that. If you have any questions, you can take a look at your worship card uh, or call the office. We can fill out that, uh, those questions for you to try and help you with that going forward. All right, uh, we're going to pray here in a minute. Two really important prayer requests we've got to mention this morning. Many of you know who Miriam Jarls is. Uh, sweet lady. She had to be taken to the hospital this morning with some health complications, and so uh, we are praying for her. We don't have a whole lot of update. I do know that she's in a room, and it sounds like they've got her stable, um, but we don't really know what's going on there. So we need to be praying for Miriam, and uh, and also we need to be praying for Mike and Melinda Combs. My, uh, Melinda's mom went home to be with the Lord uh, this morning, I believe. So um, she is rejoicing with Jesus right now, and, uh, and it's a good Lord's Day for her, but we need to be praying for and uplifting Mike and Melinda who have uh, who've cared for her for a long time, and I uh, just want to be thinking about them this morning. So would you join me in prayer as we, uh, as we begin our service? Father, we thank you 
for how you, uh, you comfort us in times of difficulty. And uh, we ask for you to give now a special measure of peace and comfort to Miriam and to Mike and Melinda Combs. And uh, Lord, you know each specific situation. You know exactly what's going on, and you are in control. And we, uh, we ask that you would comfort these families now. Um, give to us the opportunity to bless them. And, uh, and thank you, Lord, for uh, the faithfulness of, uh, of Melinda's mom and, and how we can be confident because of the gospel of her, uh, her being made whole. And so we ask now that you would, uh, you would just help in the, each of these situations. Lord, as we look forward to, to worshiping this morning and as we anticipate an opportunity to get together and study the Bible this Saturday and a missions dinner uh, in the following Saturday, we ask that you would draw us together as a church body, that we would, as, uh, as a gathered group of believers, look to you and, uh, and, and point each other to you as we think about your truth, think about your goodness to us. And, uh, and as we even think about these songs this morning and as Pastor brings the word, I pray that your spirit would be active in our hearts. Open our eyes to the truth of Scripture and cause us to change, Lord, as we submit to it. We thank you and we praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Just stand and sing. We're going to sing King of My Heart. This is a song we haven't sung here before. King of My Heart is a, is a simple prayer that, uh, that is acknowledging the superior, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the I, I lost the word, the firstness of Jesus Christ and of God in every area of our lives. He is preeminent. There it is. And, uh, and so we want to think about that. And this, this song is a simple song, thinks, it thinks through this concept, uh, and then just meditates on God's goodness. Would you sing with me uh, the, a song, King of My Heart?
let him be the first in your life. Let's sing again about the goodness of God.
Heavenly Father, as we run to you in this moment, I thank you that we can look to you, that we can trust you for all things in every way. Father, I thank you that we can trust in you with all our heart, lean not to our own understanding, and all our ways acknowledge you that you would direct our paths. Father, you, you know every need here this day. Father, I, as we think of the many needs, I can't help but think of uh, the Combs family, Mike and Melinda, as Barb has gone home to be with you after such a long battle here. And, but Father, we, I thank you that in recent days she wanted to trust you. She just looked to you and had opportunity to trust you with all her heart. Father, I thank you now that, that she is in your presence. Father, we realize that one day we will all pass from this life into the next. And, and Father, may, may, we, may that motivate us to, to be faithful to you. For the many here that know you, may we look forward to that day when we will stand in your presence and be faithful to until that day. I pray, Father, for any here that does not know you or those who are watching or listening, that one day, that this day, they might come to you in true salvation and run to you. Father, may, may as, as we have sung about and the choir just sang, that, that we run to you in our worship and that our worship would be genuine. It would come from our hearts and that you would be exalted even now in our hearts, Father, that, that we would lay aside all the other uh, concerns of this life and we would focus upon you and look to you at this time. And I pray that, that, uh, that you would then strengthen us, that you would encourage us where strength and encouragement is needed. And I thank you that, that you care. We can cast all our care upon you because you do care for us. Father, I thank you for the gospel. I thank you for the many churches around the world and the churches even here in Troy that are preaching the gospel, that people would come to you, surrender to you. And I pray that that, that would take place in our hearts even today and that, that, uh, that we would then live in light of gospel truth, to be faithful, to be strengthened, and to tell others. And so thank you that you've entrusted these matters to us and may we, again, be faithful uh, to bring glory to your name because as we sung a few moments ago, it's all about you. It's all about you. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. As, as, as uh, many of you know, mom, my mom has come to, to live with us she, she wants to be a snowbird, so she's going to live with us until, until January. And then it, after Christmas, uh, she's going to go live with my sister down in Louisiana. And then uh, in uh, May, she's going to move up and stay with my other sister up in the Akron area. And then she'll come back with us in September. And, and uh, so right now, she's, she's with us until Christmas. And we're enjoying that. Of course, it's, you know, things are unsettled, and we're working at getting things settled. But this past Thursday evening, Mom had been going through some of her memorabilia, and she said, Dale, I want to sit down, and I, I want to show you some things. And so, okay, you know. So after supper, we sat down, and, and uh, she showed me her high school yearbook. And uh, I did not realize this, but my mom had the leading role as a senior in the school play. So uh, she, and, and she was the prettiest girl in the whole play, if not the entire senior class. It was just uh, wonderful to see all of these exciting things. She was editor of the senior yearbook, uh, quite an honor there. Uh, she played in the high school band. She won a triple A driving award. So it was, it was fun going through those things and learning of these many things of my mom that, that, you know, you just, whether it came up in past conversations, I don't know, I didn't remember them, but it was fun to sit down and talk with her. <laughs> now you might think this is kind of a strange transition, but 
the Old Testament minor prophets are kind of like the elderly. <laughs> She's not that old. Come on. I'm, I didn't insinuate that. But they have many fascinating things to tell. But if you're not careful, you're going to miss them, right? Like I said, she, she may have, I may have known those things, but if, if she had told me those things in the past, I had forgotten them. And so we need to be reminded and refreshed of these things. And, uh, but, you know, once you sit down, you spend time listening, you find that, they're, that uh, the Old Testament prophets are, are interesting, they're full of uh, a wealth of information. And so we're studying the minor prophets right now, and our study today is in the book of Amos. So go ahead and turn to the book of Amos in the Old Testament. And uh, we go to, let's see, uh, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos. All right? So that's where Amos is. It's, it's about uh, in the middle of the second half of the Old Testament. And uh, we're, we're looking at Amos. And uh, so we're going to sit down with Amos and we're going to listen to a wealth of information that we may have forgotten if we hadn't talked to Amos for a while or listened to him. And if you remember, after Saul, David, and Solomon, the kingdoms were divided. You had ten tribes of the north, that was Israel, and the two tribes of the south was Judah. All of Israel, all of Judah were considered Israelites, Jews, and uh, they were God's chosen people. And the prophets spoke to the, the, the God's chosen people, and the minor prophets spoke to either one, generally speaking, to one or the other of the, the uh, kingdoms, the northern kingdom or the southern kingdom. Amos is a book written by the Old Testament prophet Amos, he was a rugged outdoorsman from the hill country of Tekoa, a town about 10 or 12 miles south of Jerusalem. Because of the Hebrew word translated shepherd here, it wasn't the typical word shepherd. It was uh, the words only used one other time in the Old Testament uh, of a sheep breeder by the name of Misha in 2 Kings chapter, chapter 3 and verse 4. And he was a sheep breeder. He supplied the king of Israel at the time 100,000 lambs and, 100, uh, and the wool of 100,000 rams. Now in Amos 5 verse 8, speaking of him being an outdoorsman, he mentions two constellations. You might just flip over to chapter 5 and verse 8. He says, he who made Pleiades and Orion... So he was familiar with the stars. He liked astronomy, I guess. And, uh, and then he also what, uh, mentions what appears to be a solar and a lunar eclipse. He who made Pleiades and Orion and turns deep darkness into morning and darkness darkens the day into night. So he was an outdoorsman. He was familiar with these kinds of things. He was also a shepherd who tended sycamore fig trees. Fascinating study. I didn't realize that they would climb these, these tall trees, and he managed this operation, by the way, and they would slice open the figs so that they would become juice, juicier as they ripened. So it was quite an quite a operation he had going here. And uh, it says there in chapter 7, verses 14 through 16, that Amos answered and said to Amaziah, We'll get to this in just a little bit. I was no prophet nor son of a prophet. I was a herdsman. That word is even different, and it's the only time it was used in the Old Testament. He was a rancher as well, a herdsman, and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Now, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. So Amos was an articulate hillbilly, all right? He was a working entrepreneur who knew how to handle this huge business operation. So quite an impressive individual. And God then 
uses Amos to speak to his people, especially Israel, the northern kingdom. That encourages me. <laughs> that just encourages me that, that as a minister of the word of God, it's just little old Dale Christian. You, you, you see, you, you, you get what you're seeing, all right? Just, just a, a common man who ministers the word of God. And that's what we see in Amos. It's interesting he ministered during, a, uh, by the way, and that means no matter who you are, you have opportunity to minister the word of God and do so faithfully. He ministered during a specific time. Look at chapter 1, verse 1. He says, two years before the earthquake. Now, there's evidence that there was a catastrophic earthquake about 760 B.C. So it appears as though it's evident that he wrote at 762, I should go this way, 762 B.C., two years before the big earthquake, right? And this gives evidence that he was the earliest of the minor prophets that wrote. Last week I said that uh, uh, Joel was one of the earliest. It's believed that Amos was the earliest of the minor prophets that prophesied. Now, this also, given just background information here, it, it was, if that were the, was the case, and it appears that it is, he ministered during a, quite a prosperous time of, of, uh, of the northern kingdom. They, they were living in prosperity. And some of these others that we've studied, you know, that was things were going downhill and there was tragedy and there was difficulties. But he's ministering to Israel during a time of prosperity. After King Uzziah of Judah and Jeroboam II of Israel's lengthy reign, so there was a certain amount of stability, prosperity. And in the northern kingdom here, the rich we're, we're going to look at are getting richer and the poor were being marginalized. Sla and because of that, slavery emerged. In chapter 2 and verse 6, and chapter 8 and verse 6, it said that they would buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and put them into slavery. Morality. You won't believe this, but look at chapter 2 and verse 7. Morality was deteriorating. A man and his father go into the same girl so that my name is profane. Profane. Morality was on its way out. And yet, in the middle of all that, their view as a northern kingdom was that, hey, things are good. Religion is great. We go to church all the time. You look at chapter 4 and verse 4. Amos is kind of, well, he is speaking sarcastically. And he says, come to Bethel. That was a place of worship. Come to Bethel and transgress. What's transgress mean? Sin. They're going to the place of worship and sin. To Gilgal and multiply transgressions. Another place of worship they considered a place of worship. And multiply your sins. Bring your sacrifices every morning your tithes and offerings every three days. They would go to a place of worship in their sin, and yet they believed they were doing okay because they went through the motions of worship and even gave their tithes. Celebrating festivals, faithfully making sacrifices, exercising religious activity, but it was fake. It was bogus because it was merely external so as to impress others. You know how much money I gave today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, business is good. God is blessing. They knew all the right things to say. They were convinced that God was for them and protected them because they were living in such prosperity. Now, that could speak to us, right? That, that could step on our toes, to think, you know, hey, you know, we're here at FBC, we're doing pretty good, right? You know, it's a little chilly outside, but it's nice and warm inside. Bills are paid. Nice, comfortable chairs. We're doing good. We have the blessing of God upon us. We've got to be careful. As we examine our hearts, 
make sure we're not merely going through the motions. We have to guard against a prosperity gospel. There's, there's a, you hear this through internet preachers and television preachers often and even other churches, maybe even in this area, that if, if you live for God, then you're going to be prosperous, mostly speaking financially prosperous, right? If you just live for God, give your life to Jesus, you're gonna, everything's going to be all right. You're going you're, you're gonna, to you're gonna make all kinds of money or you're going to live prosperously. Got to guard against that. Jesus says, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. So there may be challenges. There may be difficulties in this life. So we have to guard. We have to guard against a prosperity gospel and look at the gospel in light of the word of God. Well, that, that, that's a little bit of background on Amos. We, we think of the minor prophets. We, we looked at Hosea. If we could have a picture of, of the keyword learning system is what this is called, the picture of Hosea. Uh, or it, it, it represents the, the book. And the key word there is harlot or uh, because of Hosea's uh, uh, seeking after his wife and won her back out of her prostitution. So there was that personal issue there. The next one was Joel. We looked at Joel last week and we look at this as you have the locust eating Joel, 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 or whatever, Jello. <laughs> it helps you. you can't, sometimes you just can't get these pictures out of your mind, right? But it helps you remember that Joel was about locusts. So that's the key word there and the judgment of God. This week we have Amos. Amos. And with Amos, you see that Amos is holding a plumb line. And that will help you understand the theme here as we get to that in just a little bit. As we look at this, we're going to look at the structure, the content of the book, and then point out some lessons of application, all right? So bear with me. We, we need to understand the book. What's going on here? So that we then can live according to these truths, apply it to our lives. So we're going to look at four main parts to Amos. The first one, as you might guess, is judgment. Amos goes... To the northern kingdom, he was a prophet. Out of the southern kingdom, Tekoa, and he is told to go to Israel, the northern kingdom, and to preach to them. And the first message he preaches is that of judgment. Chapters 1 and 2. Now, in this message of judgment, he includes all the surrounding nations. Many of the surrounding nations, anyway. He... he he declares a, a message to Damascus and judgment concerning Damascus, Ga Gaza, uh, Sir, uh, uh, Tyre and Phoenicia, uh, Edom, Ammon, Moab, and Judah. And each time he talks, he's getting closer to home. But to this point, Israel was probably thinking, hey, we're doing pretty good. See, told you, judgment about all of these other nations, but we're doing pretty good. We're really religious. We got our act together. Yeah, you know, God's going to take it to all of these other nations, but we're doing pretty good. Uh, eh. Amos starts talking about how God's going to judge Israel. And the charges included injustice, Greed, oppression, immorality, profanity, blasphemy, sacrilege, all of which deserved judgment. So his first message was that of judgment. The second part, he goes on to elaborate to Israel in this second part. And I think there's some hope here because it's a call to repentance. Some people have a view that, that God is just all about, he wants to come down on all everybody's sin and he's just a big mean ogre and he just wants to judge sin. I'm telling you, the judgment, as we talked about last week, is, a, is judgment should lead us to repentance. And, and aren't, aren't you glad 
that God allows for repentance, he doesn't just <laughs> us because of our sin, but out of judgment, there's a call to repent, to come to him. And Amos appeals in chapters 3 through 6. In, in chapter 3, verse 1, chapter 4, verse 1, chapter 5, verse 1, he appeals, hear this word. God has a message for you. I don't, I don't, that's how I say it. I don't know how he said it, but he's saying, hear this word. This is a word of the Lord. This is what God says. God wants you and me to pay attention to his word. Please, when you come to church and listen to the teaching, the preaching of the word of God, don't dismiss it. It is my prayer that at every point in our teaching here at this church and the preaching that comes from this pulpit comes from the Word of God. This is the Word of God, right? And so, and I'm not, I have no pretense on thinking that I'm the greatest preacher in the whole world. I'm not. But I am committed to ministering the Word of God. Amen. And this is the Word of God. That. A Amos was just a, a, an articulate hillbilly that God used to minister the Word of God. This is the Word of God. And some highlights from this message is, the first one that we sang, we even sang about this, is that true religion is of the heart. We need this. True religion is of the heart. It's not going to church and going through the motions. It has to come from our hearts. As I mentioned, the nation experienced great prosperity, peace, and all of these religion, religious activities. Offerings were up. Oh, you know, we, we give our tithes and offerings. No major problems. People were content and they were happy. Sounds like a well-established church. The problem was that it was superficial. It wasn't from the heart. And again, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but as we think of the application of the word that we should think, when I go to church this Sunday or whatever Sunday it is, pray that God will minister to your heart and that your ears will be attached open to what he has for you. I'm convinced he has something for you because it's the word of God, right? And, and, and so, so pray that your heart would be prepared and stay, stay in tune with that. Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. God knows your heart. God knows what you're thinking. God knows where your mind is. And so stay tuned, in tune with him. But these folks had become comfortable, they had, and because of being comfortable, they had become complacent. That's a danger. It's easy when we're, we're nice and warm and comfortable here. Let's not become complacent. Another aspect of his message is that God is concerned about social injustices, or maybe I should have just said God's concerned about social justice, right? Um, luxury is not necessarily evidence of God's approval. If we're not careful, again, it can lead to complacency, even pride. Hey, look what I've accomplished. You know, I've, I've been successful in my life, and so I'm really good. And, and I do believe that as you look at those things, that that is a blessing of God, but we need to acknowledge it that it's a blessing of God, not because of who we are or our greatness. <laughs> in this uh, he was pretty bold. Chapter 4, verse 1, Amos calls the women of Israel cows of Bashan. It wasn't complimentary because they had become lazy and complacent, insistent upon luxury. They insisted that their husbands bring them more to drink. But God desires that his people have a heart for the poor and needy, care for the poor and needy. Now, I understand 
You talk about social justice in our culture right now. I believe that there's much of it is, is uh, not a biblical understanding of what God calls social justice. And I think as, when it comes to social justice as believers, we need to have a heart for the poor. We cannot pull every poor individual out of poverty. Even Jesus said when, when uh, he was anointed with a very expensive perfume, cost probably a year's wages, he did not rebuke the individual, the lady, that, that anointed him with that very expensive perfume. One of the, well, the disciples, and specifically Judas, said, hey, that could have been sold, and it could have, the money could have been given to the poor. And what did Jesus say? The poor you will always have among you. But what she did was good. So we're not, in, when it comes to social justice, we're not told to pull every poor person out of poverty. But here's what I think a challenge is for you and me here at FBC and for Christians in our culture today is to have a heart for the poor, to care for the poor. We might not be able to pull every poor person out of poverty, but, but let's guard against the, the, the attitude of poor people are just a bunch of lazy people who, who uh, are irresponsible. And that attitude can go on. And maybe you've had, as have I, have, have had some people who have taken advantage of you have taken advantage of me when it comes to trying to help them, um, but you know what? That's that. They're accountable for that. We're accountable to God for our attitudes toward individuals who are marginalized, and that that could get us into a whole other study. I understand, but I think that's something that we need to change. Our many of us need to change our thinking about as our attitude towards someone who may be struggling in their poverty. God is concerned about social injustice, social justice itself. That was part of his message. Another aspect of his message is that judgment is sure if there's no repentance. Chapter 4 and verse 10. He says, I sent among you a pestilence after the manner of Egypt. I killed your young men with the sword and carried away your horses and I made the stench of your camp go up into your nostrils, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. The judgment was to get their attention, to draw them to himself, and they ignored it. And now God says that he would come and judge them. Chapter 4 and verse 12. Therefore, thus I will do to you, O Israel, because... I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. It's like saying, if you don't repent, you're going to die. <laughs> so, there's a call to repentance. It's a serious matter. And then he talks about consequences the next part of the book is Consequences, chapter 7 through 9. And he has five visions here, the vision of locusts, fire, a plumb line. The plumb line is that God measures the nation against his standard and they don't measure up. The nation would not conform to the word of God, so judgment was coming. And when, when he talked about that, I'm going to come back to the plumb line in just a little bit. But when he was mentioning this, to the northern kingdom, there was a priest in the northern kingdom by the name of Amaziah. And Amaziah was a false priest. And he interrupts Amos at this point and he says, You're not being patriotic. Get out of here. Go back home. Preach to your own people. We don't serve your kind here. We don't like you. Go away. Amos responds by saying that God told him to preach, and preach he must. And God, as for Amaziah, Amos told him that God would judge his family and that his wife would become a prostitute and his family would die by the sword. 
So there were consequences. And there's another consequence uh, through a vision of summer fruit, that the nation was ripe for judgment. And God would judge them by taking his word from them. They didn't want to hear the word. I'm going to take it away from you. And then the vision of the altar. The Lord appears to Amos at the altar and says that judgment starts in the household of the Lord. As 1 Peter 4, 17 says, judgment starts in the household of God. It's got to start here. We've got to get the log out of our own eyes before we try helping the speck in everybody else's eye. Right? So the people had been outwardly religious, but did not have a sincere heart for God. So those are the first three parts of his message, but he finishes with a note of hope, and that is restoration. In that day I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. Aren't you happy? Aren't you, aren't you thankful, I should say, <laughs> that there's a hope of restoration, that we can acknowledge all of our sin and we can tend to focus on all of our sin and how bad we are, and yet through Jesus Christ there is hope. That's why we need a Savior, my friend. And, and yes, uh, the sin, uh, God wants us to comprehend the fact that we are sinners, but that's why he sent a Savior in Jesus Christ, to die in your place and mine. So that if you would believe that he did that for you, you repent from unbelief and you turn to him in belief, in salvation, through Jesus Christ, that he died for you on the cross and rose again victoriously so that you can have victory over sin and death and be restored to a right relationship with God. It starts right here. It starts in our hearts. So let's look at some lessons some lessons here. That's, the, that's the, the message of Amos. First one is that all are accountable to God's standard. All are accountable to God's standard. All the surrounding nations were judged and even Israel itself. And so we're all accountable for God. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 1 verse 18 says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness unright suppress the truth. So that he goes on to say, everyone is without excuse. There is a God. He has revealed himself. You look around at, at creation and, and, and the, what's going on even in the world, you can't deny that there's a God. But the fact of the matter is, we're accountable to him. And, and that ought to encourage us to say, you know what? We know the truth. We have the truth. We want everybody else to know about that truth. We, our emphasis this year is evangelism. We want other people to know the truth about salvation through Jesus Christ. And, and, and as we go from here, it's not just that the pastor uh, shares the gospel. As you have opportunity, you can share the gospel too with your, with your friends, your family, your neighbors, uh, your coworkers, your classmates, to, to tell others, to tell others about Jesus, to, to show forth Jesus. And one way we've been encouraging you to do that is to invite. You, you, you invite people to FBC that you hear the gospel. We also encourage you to move up and move in. <laughs> you know we. On Sundays, you know, people, they come in, they're looking for a seat, right? They're looking for a seat. And if they have to climb over a bunch of people to find a seat in the middle, it's kind of can be embarrassing or discouraging, you know? They just want to come in and they want to find a seat. Help them out. Hey, I'll, I'll move over, you know? It, it's all part of being soul conscious on the church property. We're all accountable to God's standard. The second lesson is that God's word must be proclaimed. Chapter 3, verse 8. Amos says, The lion has roared. Who will not fear? The Lord has spoken. Who can but prophesy? God has spoken like a lion, and I have to tell everybody what he says. In chapter 3, verse 1, 
4151, hear this word the Lord has spoken. And when Amaziah told Amos to go back home, he answered and said to Amaziah in chapter 7, verse 14, I was no prophet nor a prophet's son. I was a herdsman, a dresser of, of sycamore tree, uh, sycamore figs. I'm just a I'm just a common old shoe, man. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just who I am. But God told me to speak truth. The Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. Now, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. That's you. That's me. I'm just common old people that God wants to use to tell others about Jesus. Faithfully proclaim him. We want to show Jesus as indispensable to our community and beyond. That's what we, we need to be all about that. Show Jesus as indispensable. There is no other way. Again, what a, what a powerful concept to encourage us to continue on in this matter of evangelism, showing forth Christ. Here's another lesson, and that is God's word is your standard. God's word is your standard by which you measure all belief and actions. Chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. Chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. Again, this is, this is kind of a central theme regarding the plumb line. This is what he showed me. Chapter 7, verse 7. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand, and the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. A plumb line is an important tool for building. You saw the, the moose, a moose holding the plumb line. It's a string. It has a weight on the end. And it, because of gravity, it shows you whether the wall is straight or not. Could you imagine the Willis Tower, which we most, most commonly know as Sears Tower up in, in uh, Chicago. Thank you. Senior moment. I'm 65 now. I, just, I can blame it on something now. If they didn't use some sort of a plumb line or the Empire State Building in New York, if they didn't use a plumb line, they'd have the leaning tower of Pisa, right? You know? And sooner or later it would crash, it would crumble. Because it wasn't straight. That, that's the word of God, my friend. The, the word of God is the standard by which we judge our thinking and our attitudes and our actions. And the people of God in the northern kingdom, the people of Israel, had gotten away from the standard of the word of God. They thought it was all about them and not about Jesus, not about him. Let's not get away from the word of God as our standard. Now, that being said, I pray that this is not the only time that you hear or study the word of God is on Sunday mornings. I, I encourage you, challenge you, admonish you uh, to take time to read, and study the Word of God at other times throughout the week so that God's Word becomes precious to you. So that if or when the difficulties and challenges come, you have the rock to whom you can go. And that's to hear the Word of God and to Put it into practice. That was the difference between the wise man and the foolish man at the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. It was kind of his invitation. If you, if you don't want your house to crumble, build upon the rock. What's the rock? To hear these words of mine, the words of Jesus, and put them into practice. The foolish man heard the words of Jesus, heard that good message, that that, that the, the preacher preached, that preacher was Jesus, <laughs> but left and didn't think anything more about it, didn't put it into practice. That's, that was the difference. Both heard the word of God. One did what God wanted him to do. The other didn't, and his house crumbled. 
the wise man stood as he put it into practice lived according to the plumb line of the Word of God. God's Word is your plumb line for life. You take away the plumb line of the Word of God, you're susceptible to anything that comes along. Judge everything by the Word of God. Another lesson. The greater the light, the greater the accountability. Speaking on chapter 3, Warren Wearsby says, how can, the, how can our God send judgment upon us, the people were asking? Are we not his chosen people? But that was the very reason for the judgment. Where there is privilege, there must also be responsibility. We are so privileged. We, you, we have the word of God. We have so much access to the word of God. Through all of our devices, our phones, our tablets, our computers, along with the printed word, you know, those still are around. I don't know if you knew that or not. Um, we have a few in the, in the, under the seats in front of you. Uh, we're so privileged to have the word of God. We take it so for granted. There are some folks around this world, they, they don't have access to that. They don't have access to the word of God. And then some of them who have access, the, 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 the word is being changed. In China, they've actually, they're changing the word of God. We're privileged. We're blessed. Don't take it for granted. But the greater the light from the word of God, the greater the accountability. Another lesson, be aware, be, beware of the American dream. Beware of the American dream. I'm not saying don't have dreams and don't be successful and don't, don't, don't have goals and don't put forth effort. I'm not saying that. That's not what God's saying here. But don't view that as the end all. If you take a note, you might just jot down Matthew 6.33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Put God first, regardless to whether you're, you have or are achieving the American dream or not, put God first. Seek first the kingdom of God. And as you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, live according to biblical truth as he has outlined it in the plumb line of his word, trust him to do what he desires to do for you in, your, in this life. Beware of the American dream. And finally, God desires your heart. I, I think that's the, and I just thank, uh, praise God for the, the uh, planning team and the choir for, for emphasizing this through our worship together today. God desires your heart. He doesn't desire mere offerings or rituals. Guard against thinking that the outward efforts of worship are sufficient. God wants you to worship in spirit and in truth out of a sincere heart. Chapter 5, verse 21. Go ahead and turn there. Chapter 5, verse 21, down through 24. God says, I hate, I despise your feasts. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offering of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs to the melody of your harps. I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. He wants sincere worship. Worship from your heart. Evaluate your, the nature of your heart when it comes to your relationship with God. I, I think a, a marriage is a good illustration of this. In fact, Ephesians chapter 5 speaks to that. Uh, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, right? And he goes on. Ephesians 5, he even says, but I'm not talking about marriage. I'm talking about the church, <laughs> He's using marriage as an illustration. So I'm going to use that this morning. 
Think about a marriage where a husband and wife are married, and they live in the same house, even sleep in the same bed, and, but they do their chores. Uh, they go to work, come home from work, fulfill their responsibilities around the house, but their heart's just not in it. What would that marriage be like? It'd be empty, wouldn't it? That speaks to our relationship with God, doesn't it? Could, could you think about that, what that would be like? You go through the motions, fulfill your responsibilities, work in the nursery, do my ushering, maybe even teach a class. Ah, it's just, my heart's just not in it. I sing the songs, or I don't sing the songs, because my heart's just not in it. If, if that would be the case, what would that do to your relationship with God? What would your relationship with God be like? But boy, I tell you, you put your heart into it, it's like, yes. My goodness, and you think about a marriage that, where, you, where, where both husband and wife, their, their heart's in it, and they, they love each other, and they care for each other, and yes, they do their chores, they do their responsibilities, they live together, and, and they sleep in the same bed together, but it's a joy, it's a delight. Why? Because their heart's in it. And if, as we look at a church and a ministry, and if, if that was the nature of our, each one of our relationships with God, what would our church look like, Right? And, and praise God, we see that. And God speaks to these issues that, that, you know what, this is a church that is alive and it's vibrant. Why? Because our hearts are in it. May we, may we evaluate our relationship with God in that way and to his glory. Let's ask for his help. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your word and that we can take these truths and live in light of these truths that, that these things would be a reality, that we would care for one another, care for those who, who, who were tempted to marginalize. Father, that, that, the, the, that our hearts would be in our relationship with you, that, that we would seek to have a vibrant relationship with you, that our worship would be vibrant, that, that our church would be alive and... and, and uh, reaching out and, and that others would see you in us. It's not about us, it's about you. And that they would see you in us because we're pointing them to Jesus. So help us, Father, to surrender to you and make our relationship with you about you and not about us. And may we do that as we live according to the plumb line of your word, to your honor and glory. As you continue to pray and just ask for God's help to that end, if we can be a help and encouragement to you, I'll be down front here. We'll have someone take you aside and pray with you. After this service, I'll be in the back when we're done singing. And just say, hey, I, I need to talk to you about my relationship with God. And we want to help you with that. If you don't know Jesus, we want you to come to Jesus. We want to talk to you more about that. Father, work in our hearts to bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let me ask you a question. Do you love Jesus? I hope that's true. Another question, do you love him more than you did in the past? We should be growing in our love for Jesus. We're going to sing a song, My Jesus, I Love Thee, and look at the progression as we sing through all four verses of the song. Let's stand and sing, My Jesus, I Love Thee.
pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for what you have done, and we look forward to one day being free from the sin that plagues us every day, to eternally praise you in love and experience that relationship for, in its fullness. But for now, Lord, give us strength as we look for the opportunities to, to love each other and to show that love to a world that doesn't know it. Give us those opportunities. Help us to be obedient in that this week. In Jesus' name, amen.